We're still in Ephesians chapter 6, talking about the, the Christian battle and the armor of God. We're going to get uh, a little more into that uh, in our lesson this morning. Good to see everybody. Everybody here survived the storms I take on Friday night as best as possible. Uh, we are seeing a lot of our folks out today as the final day of camp is wrapping up. I noticed that uh, Chris and Glenda are back, but others will be coming back later this evening as they break camp today, and good that uh, they had a wonderful time. Good to see the East Steps are back. Good to see you guys. Everybody's getting their vaccinations and doing better. Look at, got John and Diane Richardson with us this morning. Good to see you guys. Yes. So we do have a number of people that we're going to be praying for today, and we're going to make those announcements here later in the morning. We've got some that are going to have surgery, and some that are battling uh, some other illnesses and such, so we want to keep them in our prayers. As I said, we'll make those in our main announcements here in just a little bit. But uh, we go into our study here of Ephesians chapter 6, and last time we talked about the battle of the Christian. We're going to read the passage again. We're going to kind of do a quick summary of the, the first few verses, and then we're going to pick up with uh, what we are to adorn ourselves with, the Christian uh, armor, and uh, get into a study on that here in just a moment. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Ephesians chapter uh, 6. We begin this morning, and uh, we're going, as I said, we're going to read the chapter or read the text, verses 10 through 20, and then continue our discussion uh, from where we left off last Sunday. There's something within this lesson that I'm going to try to find a, a separate thought on and do a lesson on that. I know I'm going to be missing a Sunday here in the month of May. Delighted to announce that Jose is going to be doing one of the classes in May, doing his report on Mexico and actually preaching that Sunday. I believe it's the 23rd of May, so I'm looking forward to hearing Jose from, uh, preach from the pulpit. And uh, he's going to be do doing his report in class on uh, his work in the mission field in Mexico. So keep that in mind. But I want to do a lesson strictly on the sword of the spirit and talk about that here in our Bible class because I think it's very important for us to recognize what the main weapon of the Christian soldier is to carry. And that is the sword of the spirit what Paul says is the Word of God, the Word of God that's living, the Word of God that is active, the Word of God that is sharper than any two-edged sword, oh, the Word of God which can pierce and uh, divide and discern the spirit of man. The Bible is that important. The Word of God is that important. And Paul, through the pen of inspiration, describes the, the word of God as that sword. And so we'll be talking about that just briefly this morning. But as I said, I want to get into a complete lesson on nothing but uh, that, that one weapon, the sword of the spirit. And Lord willing, I'm going to try to work on that for next Sunday. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole or full armor of God that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God that you may be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm, stand firm therefore. Or as we talked about it last week, keep on standing. Having girded your loins with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace in addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming missiles of the evil one or the fiery darts and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. With all prayer and petition, praying at all times in the spirit and with this in view, 
be on the alert with all perseverance and petition or petition for all the saints. Pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains that I am proclaim that in proclaiming it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. We talked about it last week, church, that we as Christians must have the strength to fight the good fight of faith. That's what the Apostle Paul did, and we talked about the summary of his life as the apostle, as the preacher, as the evangelist, when he told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, I have fought the good fight of faith. I finished the course. There's that crown of righteous, righteousness laid up for me. Why? Because Paul realized one thing as that apostle, as that evangelist, as that preacher of the gospel, that he could do what? All things through Christ, which strengthens me. The soldier needs that physical strength to fight that battle. He also, I believe, needs that inner strength to fight that battle. And the Christian needs that inner strength, that inner fortitude to carry on the battle. And that's why we can say as a child of God that it's not me, it's Christ. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Philippians chapter four and verse 13. And we're armed with God's strength in the battle. And we must have that determination to be a strong soldier in the battlefield. We need to have that responsibility to grow in spiritual strength we talked about last week. Paul is instructing the church to put on the whole armor of God, coming from that gr Greek word that we talked about last week, the panoply of God. When we sing that very word, in the song, Soldiers of Christ Arise, putting on the panoply of God or the whole armor of God. We're to dress ourselves with the spiritual weapons for this warfare that we have. And lest we not forget, what is our battle against? Who is our number one enemy? The devil, Satan, and his adversaries. It's not the fleshly things of this world that we're doing battle with. It is the spiritual forces, and that is the spiritual forces of Satan. We need to withstand the wiles of Satan. We talked about the cunningness and the craftiness and the slyness that Satan is all about, that he can be described as an angel of light, but he could also be a roaring lion seeking whom he, whom he uh, may devour. We talked about in verse 12, the, the warfare, the battle is not physical. It's not with physical weapons. It's rather with spiritual weapons. We talked about in verse 13 that there is a necessity for the child of God of putting on that whole armor, sincerely putting it on, the entire armor, not just one piece. If you have only one piece and you're missing the rest, What's going to happen? You're prone to the enemy. You're prone to attack and destruction. The whole armor is needed to withstand, Paul says, in the evil day. All right, there's a quick summary of last week. We call it in a nutshell. Now let's pick up verse 14. Verse 14 again, Paul writes, Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Now we talked about it some last week. When we think about athletes and especially football players who are playing on the gridiron, what do they need? What, is, what are some of the things that a football player needs equipment-wise? Shoulder pads to protect the shoulders from injury. What else? A helmet to protect the head. We, we hear so much today about the concussions that many of our athletes are suffering, especially football players, when they get hit hard uh, by a, a tackler or a defender. So shoulder pads, a helmet, what else? 
He needs maybe even some protection around there, yes, to protect the ribs from injury. Quarterbacks, I remember many quarterbacks have and still suffer rib injuries, and now they're making uh, protective equipment for the quarterback to have protection there. What else? Cleats. You need, you need traction. I remember when they put out that AstroTurf back in the 60s and 70s, and you really didn't need the cleats, but you still had uh, some traction you needed. And so they did make traded shoes, not the ones with the big cleats. And now they've got this new type of turf, which is adaptable for any kind of shoe just about. But again, you need that grip, that traction, that uh, ability to move on the field or else you're not going to get anywhere. So there's some things, and there's other uh, descriptions uh, of equipment that we can talk about, but those are some of the main things. Now, what if that football player went onto the football field on Sunday afternoon without a helmet? Some of you might remember that back in the day when they played football, they didn't even have face masks. And they didn't even have plastic helmets. They had leather helmets with no padding. And you can just imagine the way they tackled back then. They didn't tackle the way you see it today. I mean, they grabbed from the shoulders. They tried to rip the helmet off. I mean, they were vicious. Nowadays, if you don't have the proper equipment, you're not going to make it. And that's the same church when it comes to the Christian armor. As I said it before, you're going to miss one piece. You're missing it all. You need everything that Paul describes in these passages here from verses 14 through verse 17. If the Christian is going to stand, he must be arrayed with the armor of God. And Paul used the excellent illustration here in Ephesians chapter 6 of the Roman soldier. The Roman soldier of the first century generally wore a girdle into battle or a belt, and the belt held his armor in place as well as securing the sheath for his sword. How important is it for us guys to have a belt for our pants or uh, suspenders? You don't have that, you're, you're, you're going to have to be doing this all day long, pulling your pants up. It's important for that belt. And the belt here was important to the soldier because it held the armor in place. The soldier has a belt of truth wrapped around him. A belt of truth to hold in place all the other weapons and all the other pieces of the Christian armor. If you don't have it, you are ineffective. Without the truth, the word of God, John 17 and 17, the armor is going to do you no good. The entirety of the word or of your word, the psalmist said, is truth, Psalm 119 and 160. The truth of God guides us. It directs us and, yes, even protects us. Without it, we, cannot, we could not be saved and cannot live in heaven with the Father. We need the truth of God. We need that belt, that, gird, uh, that girding piece that we wrap around ourselves to keep the armor intact and the weapons intact as well. Paul speaks here of our loins girded with truth. What else does he say here in verse 14? What's the other piece of weaponry he speaks of in the verse? The breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate of righteousness. And Gene was talking about that a moment ago. The breastplate to the soldier did what? It protected the chest area. Protected, and it even went down toward the abdomen, protecting that. The breastplate of righteousness protected the vital organs of a soldier of the day. The Christian's uh, breastplate is righteousness, as we said, the doing of God's will, the doing of things that are right. 
and pleasing to God. Listen to what the psalmist again says. This is from Psalm 119 and verse 172. All your commandments, he said, are righteousness. Notice what the Lord is describing for us there. The righteousness of God. He also describes it as well in the Old Testament. Go to uh, Isaiah, if you will, for a moment. Isaiah 59 and verse 17. The writer of Isaiah even describes the breastplate of righteousness, just like the apostle Paul does. Isaiah 59 and verse 17. And he put on righteousness like what? Like a breastplate. And he even says the helmet here, just like Paul did. The helmet of salvation on his head. And he put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself with zeal as a mantle. So yes, even the writer of the Old Testament passage, Isaiah, refers to some of the very same things that Paul talks about here in Ephesians chapter 6, especially the breastplate of righteousness, protection, covering. All your commandments, he said, are righteousness. Now notice something else about this breastplate and how important it is for us as Christians to wear it. We are not to wear the breastplate of our own device or our own creation. There is a specific breastplate that is spoken of here. But you know, in the religious world and in the world today, people want to do it their own way. But you know, Christian living is not like Burger King. Have it your way. It's doing it God's way. And there's a specific protection for us to protect our spiritual vital organs. It makes it harder sometimes for us unjust criticism to uh, affect us or for malice from others to hurt us, for betrayal from friends to pierce our heart. But doing the will of the Father keeps us going forward and keeps us standing. Remember what Paul said here in the letter? Therefore, take up the full armor of God that you may be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm, stand firm therefore. Keep on standing that we may defeat the devil, that we may defeat his enemy. Doing the will of the Father keeps us going forward and keeps us standing. Now, look at the next verse, verse 15. Having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now, we know in life how important it is to have shoes on where we go somewhere. We don't get in the car and turn on our car engine and we drive to the grocery store barefooted. A couple of people I've seen in the past try to do that, but <laughs> you don't go somewhere barefooted. You want to be fully dressed, and especially you want to have shoes on, especially if you're walking in a mall or, or at Walmart or at the grocery store, because what do shoes provide? Protection and what else? Traction and comfort. If, you st if you're on your bare feet and you're not used to it, what are you going to end up having? Maybe some blisters. <laughs> Have you ever had a blister on your foot and that blister pops? That's not a comfortable feeling. So you need those shoes. You need the protection of your feet. Spiritually, why do we need to have our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace? Because we're running a race. We're in the race that God has told us about. And we need that ability to move forward. Not backwards, not off to the sides, 
but moving forward, pressing on to the, toward the goal, pressing on toward the mark, the high calling in Christ Jesus. And when you think about the soldier back then, and I don't see how they survived with them, but the soldier of the Roman days wore sandals, open-toed shoes. They wore a sandal-like boot, which helped them walk on all kinds of ground and helped them maintain a good foothold. Now I see today, even our modern military, they wear boots that look like track shoes. <laughs> In other words, they have some traction underneath that can get them up the hills and across the rugged terrain, through the desert if they're there, the jungles, wherever it might be. The soldier back then wore this sandal-like boot which helped him walk on all kinds of ground and maintained a good foothold. Notice what we're saying here as we apply it in the spiritual realm. A soldier of Christ needs a good foothold. A spiritual soldier is not ready for battle. That soldier is not prepared without what? The sword of the, uh, I'm sorry, with, with the feet of, prepared with the gospel of peace. The gospel, the gospel of Christ is our traction. The gospel of peace is our ability to go through the rough and rugged times, spiritually speaking. Because as a soldier of Christ, you're going to have hills to climb. You're going to have mountains to encounter. You're going to have valleys so yeah, you'll have peaks and lows, but what does God want us to do? Be prepared with the proper adornment as a Christian soldier. And so you need the gospel of peace, which is like these sandals that these soldiers in Rome wore back in the first century. The gospel of peace, which gives you a strong foothold in the battles that you face preparing you to meet the enemy, preparing you to survive the trials that this life throws at us. And Paul calls it the gospel of peace because when you received it, it brings peace to not only you, but it brings peace with God as well. Now, look on next, if you will, here at verse 16. In addition to all, take up the shield of faith. And I'm going to stop right there for just a moment. How important was that shield to that Roman soldier back in the day? What, what, what was that soldier facing? What kind of, what kind of weapons were, were thrown at him? Arrows, arrows that could pierce the body. That's why they needed that breastplate. But also, he says here, a shield to do what? Place, exactly, place right up there in front of your body. It is. It is. And how would those, sometimes those arrows would hit you straight or try to hit you straight, but sometimes they would be thrusted way up in the air and come down. So even a, the attack from above, you needed a shield to thrust, throw that, that off. Exactly, you're bringing up my next point there, Billy. <laughs> That's all right. Think about our police officers today. How protected are they? Even the ones that drive in the patrol cars look like SWAT, SWAT people because they need a, a protection from the bullets. They need protection for all, all members of their body. They sometimes even have to wear a helmet when they're out on, out on the cases and fighting crime. So it's very important to have the, the weaponry, but especially to have this shield which will ex help you to extinguish 
what the New American Standard here calls the flaming missiles or those flaming arrows. And that's what they had to face with all the time were these arrows that would hit. As I said, they would come down or they would hit right straight on. And they needed that protection. They needed that full body protection against those arrows and those weapons that were thrown by the enemy. Notice else what, what he says here. Look at verse 17. And take, and we'll take it one at a time because we have two things to consider here. First of all, the helmet of salvation. We talked about it a moment ago using the illustration of the football player. The football player has the helmet to protect his head from a concussion. And sometimes those helmets don't protect enough. I mean, if you get hit hard, helmet to helmet even, is what they're watching today in some of our football games. If there's a helmet to helmet contact, sometimes that other player can get disqualified. And sometimes the football player is deliberately using the helmet to helmet to take out a player. Be careful that you have the protection for your head. I'm sorry, somebody was saying something? Okay. Margaret, I thought you were telling us something. Put on that helmet of salvation to protect you. And again, everything that we're considering here this morning, church, every piece of weaponry that is described here by Paul is an element of protection. It's an element of defense. But oftentimes it, it can be used on the offense, on the attack. The helmet of salvation. And then what else does Paul say? Not only take upon yourself the, the helmet of salvation, but as I said it a moment ago, and I want, as I said at the top of the lesson, I want to do a complete lesson on just this phrase right here. What are we talking about? The sword of of the Spirit, which is what? The Word of God. It's so nice that Paul can tell us what this sword of the Spirit really means. It is. It's the Word of God. It's the Bible. How often do we refer ourselves to God's Word on a daily basis? How often does a soldier need to look at his battle plans and to listen to the direction of his general? There is such a thing in battle as strategy. Strategy. What is strategy? It's a plan. It's a plan. Every, every sport that I watch, pretty much, has strategy. There's strategy in football. There's strategy in basketball. Baseball even has some strategy. Hockey. You've got to have a plan. The plan, the, the element of strategy is for what? What's the purpose of it? To win. To come out on top. To be number one. If you're not setting up weekly or daily a plan of strategy as, a, as an athlete or even as a soldier, what are you setting yourself up for? Failure. Exactly. Our strategy as a child of God, our strategy as a Christian soldier comes from where? The Word of God. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that need not be ashamed, handling accurately, rightly dividing the Word of truth. What's the purpose of God's Word? Pardon? Pardon? to protect and, and to instruct us. Paul tells us many things about the Word of God, that it's living it's, and it's active. And it's important that we have to have this, this sword of the Spirit. The weapon was important for the soldier. If the soldier does not have a, a machine gun or some automatic weapon to go out in the, in the field of battle... And he just goes out on his own and doesn't even have a knife 
What's going to happen? The enemy's going to kill him, take him down. We need weaponry. We need not only that strategy, but we need weaponry. We need the Word of God. When you sit down and you study the Word of God with someone one-on-one, what do you bring with you? You just bring all your head knowledge up here and, and from what you know and what you've experienced and what you, you've learned in the past, you just tell somebody that? No. You need the Word of God. Why do you need the Word of God? Because when you're studying with that person, you've got to have something to back yourself up, to prove. Proof. We live in a day and an age in which people have denied the word of God. They deny the existence of God. What do we need to have to, to show them that, this, uh, that, that God is and that the word of God is alive and it's the, it's, it is the word of God? We've got to have the evidence. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We've got to have the proof. We've got to have the weapon the sword of the spirit, the word of God to take down the enemy. God's word is your number one weapon. So let's go back for just a second before we move forward and take a look at our armor, the full armor of God that Paul describes not only in verse 11 but verse 13. What are we started with? Go back to verse 14. What do we start with? The girdle. Gird your loins with what? The truth of God. Your word is truth, God. Put on, secondly, what? The breastplate of righteousness, that that shield, that protection there across the, the upper body and even the lower body. Thirdly, shod your feet With what? The preparation of the gospel of peace. Take next, verse 16, the shield of faith to protect you against the flaming missiles, the fiery darts of the evil one. Take on the helmet of salvation. And finally, the word of God, the sword of the spirit. But Paul doesn't stop there. Look at the next verse, verse 18. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the spirit. And with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. Notice what Paul here is saying in this verse. As a Christian soldier, we need to be what? On alert, to be on our guard. Because why? We never, as they like to say, we never know what's coming around the corner. As a child of God, you are facing the devil. We know that. But how does the devil act? He's like, as we said a moment ago, he can be a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, but he can also be described as what? an angel of light. He might disguise himself as something good with maybe even a good message, a positive message. But in the end, it turns out to be destruction. It is important to know the elements of the devil. It is important to know what to face. And he says here in the verse, with prayer and petition, pray at all times in the spirit. It's another way of what Paul said in the scripture to pray without, pray without ceasing. Now we know as we pray, brethren, we pray for what? We pray for thanksgiving of our blessings. We pray for, uh, you know, good health. We pray for, Many other great things that happen in our life on a daily basis. But what else should we be praying for in light of what we're reading here this morning? 
We need to be praying that we will stand ready as a Christian soldier. We need to be standing firm on the, on the solid rock, the rock that will help us to grow, the rock that will help us in our Christian life. Go back, if you will, to a passage that Jesus refers to in the Sermon on the Mount. Look at Matthew chapter 7, if you will. And notice what Christ says about the foundations that we as people need to stand on. Matthew chapter 7, beginning at verse 24. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts upon them may be compared to a wise man who built his house upon the rock. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and burst against that house. And yet it did not fall for it had been founded upon the, the rock. And what is the rock here being referred to as? The firm foundation, uh, God. If we're not standing upon God and his word, notice what we will end up being like. Verse 26, Matthew chapter 7. And everyone who hears these words or sayings of mine and does not act upon them will be like the foolish man who built his house upon the sand. What's the difference between sand and rock? What does sand do? Sand shifts. Sand moves. Rock, almost impossible. Of course, you might be able to get a torrent of rain that might move some rocks. But generally, rock is a solid foundation. Have you ever noticed when someone builds a house, what's the first thing they're building? The foundation. What's one of the key ingredients that they use? Cement, concrete. What if they use something else to completely different to build that foundation? Is that foundation going to stand? Is that house going to stand? Likely not. What's the meaning of, of that concrete? What is, when that concrete settles and sets, what, what does it end up being? Rock hard. You can break your toe if you tried to kick it. The only way you're going to break it is with possibly a sledgehammer. But nowadays we see the reinforced concrete, which makes it even harder to break. But you need that solid foundation. A Christian soldier needs a solid foundation, a, a foundation that stands upon a rock, not the sand. What happens to this person who builds his house upon the sand? Verse 27 of Matthew chapter 7, the rains descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house. And what happened to the house? It collapsed, it crashed, it fell and great was the fall of it. Build your foundation, as the kids sing, upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And as he says, be on guard. Be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. For you do not know what your adversary, the devil, is going to throw at you Next, look at verse 19, and he says, pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel. Paul here has adorned himself with the Christian armory. Paul himself has says that we need to be on the alert just like he is on the alert. And then he says here in this verse, pray on the behalf of him that utterance may be given to him when he is what? Preaching the gospel. Because as Paul is preaching the gospel, what's going on around him at this time? There is the hatred of the Jew and there is the hatred of the Romans for the, pro the progression of the body of Christ at this time. Because at this time, that the Apostle Paul is preaching the gospel, he's turning the world upside down through the help of, of God and Jesus Christ. The church is causing the world to be turned upside down with its tremendous growth 
and its acceptance of the gospel over Judaism, over the Roman government, and so forth. He's fighting this fight. And in a sense, Paul's the lead soldier. Paul's the number one man out there in the battle, along with others. He needs strength. He needs help, just like you. As you're battling the devil, as you're battling the enemy of the flesh, the enemy of the world, you need protection, you need to be on guard, and you need strength, utterance, so that you can make known to others the gospel message, so that you can tell others about Jesus without fear of molestation from someone. And finally, notice what Paul says here in our last passage, verse 20. Paul is in what? He's in chains. Meaning what? He's a prisoner. He's a prisoner of the system. He's a prisoner of the Roman government. He's a prisoner to the Jew. Because the Jew hated him. The Romans hated him. His trials, he did the best that he could in defending himself but he was still put in prison. Not once, but how many times? Twice. And so as a prisoner, he calls himself the ambassador in chains. He says, pray for me that I may proclaim and boldly speak the gospel, even in my chains, even in my distress, even in my solitude and confinement, and in, in imprisonment. Now, histo but biblical historians will tell us that in Paul's first imprisonment, he had a little more freedom to move about. But on the second imprisonment, what happened? He was pretty much confined and he couldn't go anywhere. And he knew that his days had come. He knew that his time of preaching the gospel and preparing others for the gospel was coming toward an end. That's why Paul was able to say the following, and these will be our thoughts as we close this morning. Notice what Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. This is what he tells the evangelist Timothy to do. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his, and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside unto fables. But you, be sober in all things, endure hardship, do the work of an, of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. This is Paul telling Timothy to be about your business. Why? Verse 6, 2 Timothy 4, for I'm already being poured out as a drink offering and the time of my departure is at hand or the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. Paul truly believes that as a Christian soldier, adorned with the armament that we talked about earlier in this lesson, he prepared himself to fight, and he fought that good fight. So therefore, he could say the following. In the future, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but all who love his appearing. Let's pray. Father, thank you for instructing us through your word the way that we are to adorn ourselves as Christian soldiers. Help us to realize what our fight is involving, that it's not just a one-time uh, situation, but it's an everlasting fight that we will fight till the day we leave this earth. Help us to be strong. Help us to be bold.
carry out the message and to fight the battle with the sword of the Spirit and with the proper weaponry and armament. Help us in those battles, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, and we will continue in chapter 6 next time.